Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video, we're going to be talking about normal mapping. Now, normal mapping is a technique that lets you add lots of really tiny, really subtle lighting detail into textures. So for instance, I got this scene right now, and it doesn't look terrible, but it's really bland and, you know, it's just not that interesting. So, this is the before, and if we want to add in normal mapping, well, then this is the after. Yeah, look at all that. So, what it just did is add a whole bunch of really tiny detail t telling light, well, how it should bounce off the texture at very particular points. And if you move around, you see the effect just gets even better. So yeah, this is a really awesome technique. It lets you add in a whole lot of detail into textures that you just can't just by having a basic texture. So that's what we're going to be discussing in this video, and indeed in the next couple videos, because it's kind of a bit, it's not a huge topic, but it's big enough to warrant at least more than one. So yeah. So I'm going to start things off by talking about how normal mapping works and what it is, even. And to do that, I'm going to briefly review how lighting works in 3D games. So, in your typical 3D game, you'll have some mesh, defined by vertices, a whole bunch of points in 3D space. And when you send these to the graphics card, it'll connect the dots and make a mesh. So, if you're looking at, I don't know, if these vertices, say, represent a surface, and you're looking at it edge-on, it might look something like this. And if you're just interested in doing solid 3D models with no lighting or shading or anything, this is great. This is all you need. Where this becomes a problem is when you want to do lighting. Because if you want to do lighting, you need to know what direction is up on a surface. And how can you find what direction is up on these, any of these surfaces? It's a little tricky. So what people will do is they'll store another thing with the vertex called the normal. And all that is, is it's a direction vector saying what direction is up from this vertex. And usually your normals will look something like this for a surface like this. And th that's great. But what this allows you to do is you can average all the normals for the vertices of a particular face and get the up vector for whatever that face is. So, that's nice, and if you want to do normals like that, that gives you all you need to do nice, flat shading, where it's just polygon per polygon lit, and well, that it's better than no lighting, but it's still pretty ugly. So, usually you don't stop there. Usually, you won't just average the vertices, usually you'll just completely interpolate the normal across the entire face, and you get so slow, sort of slowly, you know, r interpolating between them, slowly rotating between the two extremes across the vertices, depending on, well, you know, where it is on the face. And that gives you very smooth lighting. Even though the actual surface is this very sort of harsh, jagged mesh, because the normals are being smoothly interpolated across the face, you get sort of this simulated surface that lighting is being performed on. It looks something like this, very smooth. And that's why a lot of games can get away with using really low polygon meshes and still get very smooth lighting on everything. But there's a problem with this. What if the surface I'm trying to render isn't smooth? What if I'm trying to render, say, I don't know, a plane made of bricks? You know, bricks are sort of rough and jagged and whatnot. So, you know, you probably don't want it to be smooth. And in this arrangement, well, let me show you. So, if you wanted to create the plane with bricks, you'd start with your vertices, just like before. The GPU would connect them. And just like before, that doesn't have enough information to actually do lighting. So, you'll store the normals. You'll interpolate them across the face. And, with interpolated normals, the sort of simulated lighting surface looks something like this. Perfectly flat. And your bricks will look as such. They will look completely flat, and 
that's just it's not appealing to the eye. The eye wants to see all the sort of fine details on the bricks where there's sort of like crevices, they're sort of like I don't know. I don't know what they're called. They don't not an expert on bricks, but you know, the sort of like jag good grooves and whatnot, all in bricks. And yeah. So if you're trying to render anything that isn't a perfectly smooth surface, this technique doesn't work. So there needs to be another way of doing this. So let's try again. Let's look at what we want to happen. Now we still want our two points, because you know, and we still want them to be connected, and we still want our normals, because that's fine. That's all defining the mesh, we don't have any issue of that. What our issue is, really, is with the interpolation. Rather than having the, these normals interpolated, we'd rather be able to have sort of these jagged normals. Ones representing directions, well, you know, normals that are sort of jagged, going off a little bit, being offset, a little bit noisy. And when you do that, that'll give you a very sort of bumpy well, lighting surface. And when you draw the object with a, sur a lighting surface like this, it'll look really bumpy, even if it's made of only one polygon. And that'd be kind of cool. There's, the only question is, how on earth are you going to do that? And this is a trick. I mentioned before that these normal vector, er, okay, these normals are usually represented with a vector. And your typical vector has some x, y, and z point, to rep you know, just to represent the direction. And that's nice. Another thing you have in 3D games is textures. And textures are usually represented with some r, g, and b value. So, you know, just representing the color. And you might notice there's a bit of a correlation here. Vectors have three components, colors have three components. What if we stored all these finely tuned directions, these finely tuned normals, in a texture like this. Well, all we'd have to do is take all our vectors, pretty much say, okay, they're actually colors, store them in a texture like that, and then all you'd have to do is read from the texture what the normal should be, and what do you know, you've got this nice bumpy lighting surface which gives you this really bumpy, rigid, or not rigid, but you know, <laughs> a really bumpy, rough surface with all nice, fine, faceted detail in there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the concept of normal mapping. This texture is generally called a normal map, and this can add a, just a huge, huge amount of detail to meshes. You can get, you can take one polygon and make it look like it's constructed out of millions of polygons, just because of all the fine, faceted detail that normal mapping adds to something. So that's what normal mapping is, and that's the sort of advantage of using that. So, let's talk about some of the pros and cons of doing things like this. For one, it's obviously a lot more flexible than just having polygons. If you want fine, faceted detail, you don't need millions and millions of polygons to do so. You can just make a texture, have one polygon for the primary surface shape, and you're done. And so you have lots more flexibility and a lot more detail. Another advantage of this is because of the texture, it can be created and customized by artists. They're already working with textures anyways, what's one more texture to them? So they can create all these normal map textures specifically for whatever surface is supposed to have that particular roughness, you know? They can customize the roughness for whatever surface you're supposed to be drawing. And that can get you some really, really good looking materials when all that roughness detail is specifically designed for what you're trying to be well, what you're trying to render. And of course, this is fast. It's just a texture lookup. GPUs are already really fast at texture lookup, so there's not that much to it. Very fast, very cheap, it adds tons of detail. Of course, there's a few disadvantages as well. Of course, because you're having more than one texture, you're going to need some extra memory. 
and you also need some extra memory for s storing things in vertices. I'll talk about that in a moment. But yeah, if you're in a really heavily memory constrained environment, it might be advising against this, but usually this isn't an issue. It's it's worth considering, as we'll increase your memory footprint, but in most cases this isn't much of an issue. But again, that depends on your case, and it's worth considering. Another really big disadvantage to this is that all the detail is flat. If you're drawing a plane with a brick texture on it, yeah, you'll have that fine, fasted detail, but you can still tell it's a completely flat plane, just with a little bit of roughness to it. So you can't take, say, a flat plane and make it look like there's a huge mountain range coming out of it. Well, not usually, anyways. So... Yeah, you're sort of limited to very fine, very small bumps and grooves in there. You can't make sort of, I don't know if you want to call it mid-level mid detail, things that are sort of between fine and broad detail. You can't really do anything except fine detail, I should say. So that's one disadvantage. Another disadvantage is that using normal mapping at all will cause some amount of performance overhead for every object in the scene. Even if you're drawing a million objects without normal mapping and one object with normal mapping, you'll still have a performance penalty for all those objects. And here's why. If you have code to do normal mapping, well, what about all the other objects? They're still going to need some normal somewhere, so what you'll usually do is you'll bind some texture that just has an up vector, and that's the only thing there. And that'll sort of work for everything that's supposed to quote-unquote not have normal mapping. But that's still going to require all the calculations and whatnot involved with normal mapping. So, yeah, this is going to cost more for every object, even if you're not using normal mapping on those objects. Alternatively, you can have two sets of shaders, one that does normal mapping and one that doesn't do normal mapping, and draw all the objects that don't use normal mapping with the shaders that, you know, don't have normal mapping code in them, and that can save you a lot of this performance penalty, but you're still going to have a performance penalty in shader switching, so it doesn't go entirely away, but yeah. And as I note here, this isn't a big performance penalty at all. You, In 99.9% .9 of the cases, this is completely irrelevant, but it's worth being aware of, especially if you're doing a lighting technique like forward rendering, where the light can sometimes require you to draw the scene many times in a single frame just to get all the lights in there. Because, well, this performance overhead is per object. If you're drawing all the objects five times, you're going to get five times the performance overhead of normal mapping. So, you know, situations like that, this can matter, but usually it's not an issue. And yeah. So now that we've gone over normal mapping, now that you hopefully understand some of the pros and cons of it, and hopefully understand what for the techniques appropriate for whatever you're supposed to be doing, we can discuss some of the implementation details, some of the gotchas with this technique. And there's surprisingly few of them. If you understand how the technique works, that's pretty much letter for letter how it's implemented. There's really only one trick to it. And here's the thing. Let's say I have my vertices, have my plane, has my bump mapping, or has the normals, of course. And, yeah, you, you, got, you got your plane. This is the same plane I, as before, has all the bump mapping and whatnot. And that's great. But, what happens if I'm not rendering a flat plane? What happens if I'm rendering a plane like this, at sort of an angle? Well, the normal map's still specifying the exact same directions, even at an angle. So if I tried putting all the normal mapped normals on here, they look something like this. And that's going to give you completely wrong lighting. This is obviously not the up direction of the surface. So, this doesn't work. So, let's try this again. We're going to need to do something to adjust the normal map so it fits the orientation of whatever object we're rendering. And here's sort of how this works. Right now we're specifying everything with vertices. And they have the normals, which re represent the up direction. And that's great. But what if we included something else? 
rather than just specifying the up direction, what if we also specified the right direction, the tangent? Well, if you know matrix math, you know you can do something really interesting here, because you can create a rotation matrix from an up and a right vector. So, see where I'm going with this? So, I can, so if I store a tangent at every vertex, I can get a rotation matrix that represents the rotation needed to bring all the normal, well, I should say all the normal maps, but you know, the normal map, <laughs> in, into the orientation of the plane. And that's exactly how this works. Just take the normal and the tangent, use it to create a rotation matrix, and then when you take your normal texture and you sample from it, you'll multiply whatever normal you sample by the rotation matrix to rotate it into the proper orientation. And after that, your all the normals will be showing up in the correct orientation for the plane, and all's good in the world. And that's really the only trick to this. Everything else is just straightforward, letter for letter, exactly how the technique, well, is described, what it is. And there. And at this point, you really understand enough to go out and implement normal mapping on your own. You can go out, take your own rendering engine, and add in some normal mapping, and play around with it, see what you can achieve with it. But... If you'd like a little bit more detail into how implementing normal mapping works, I'm going to make a follow-up video on this, where I'm going to take an actual 3D game engine that doesn't have normal mapping, and I'm going to show you how you could add in normal mapping. And that'll give you an idea of how normal mapping actually is implemented in 3D game engines, and it'll give you some hints on how to implement it efficiently, and possibly a few of the more minor gotchas that can come along with implementing this. Not that there's that many, but hey, it's there. So, thank you, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and 